hey guys so for those of you tuning in um on on youtube uh feel free to, to leave a comment you know uh, like subscribe all that fun stuff um, when we bring in speakers like isaac it's always great um that the more kind of interaction we get on on some of the content we uh we post um the more it, it reaches more people right and so um some of the interactions some of the comments you guys make and and you know being able to like like videos like this um it might just help a uh, startup or entrepreneur out there. So just wanted to, to leave that, um, you know, with you guys. So, but, but today we have, we have Isaac Wang. He's a, a civil uh, technologist, I believe is the right term. <laughs> a lot and, of uh, is, is that right? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's what I had listed on your LinkedIn profile. I thought that sounded kind of neat. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so I'll, I'll let him kind of have the floor. He can tell a little bit more about himself and, uh, I know we got some great stuff planned and he's got some great insight he wants to share with everyone. So we're excited. Sure. Sure. Uh, did you just want a quick introduction and then you continue to ask questions or did you just want me to do? Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself for, for those who are on or those who are tuning in that, that don't know you very well. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so name's Isaac Wang. Uh, I came to San Diego after graduating from Duke university with a degree in public policy studies. Uh, Started as a service warfare officer for the United States Navy for about four years, got out in 2014. Uh, initially was working as a defense contractor at Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, then decided to go pursue entrepreneurship, selling uh, specialty coffee to service members overseas. Um, after that, I went to go study urban planning, uh, got, got a little certificate from Harvard Graduate School of Design, uh, then did a little bit of work in active transportation planning. That That's sort of when I started working on some things related to GIS, geographic information systems. Uh, had met Curling, had, you know, tried to build up a, a GIS startup of my own and called it GI Sexy. And uh, this startup was basically trying to, you know, find, like design better software uh, that does a lot of what Esri's arc map would do, except with a easier to use like interface. Uh, and so did that for a little bit uh, and then I decided to just go run for office because uh, I was really interested in a lot of the, the work that I was doing for active transportation. So ran for San Diego City Council this past election cycle. Um, did not get past the primary, unfortunately. Got third place, but I needed to get one or two. Uh, so now I work at the San Diego County Taxpayers Association where we do a lot of just analysis and research um, just on a variety of like topics that impact local taxpayers. Uh, so I think the real value I can bring to um, a lot of you guys is being able to share some of my insight and thinking about uh, specifically the concept of scalability, because I've tried to do entrepreneurship in a, in a variety of ways, in a variety of in, uh, industries, and I've really thought about how to uh, really scale things and you know what works and what doesn't work. And I think uh, I've learned a lot through my own personal failures uh, and some of my own successes. Yeah, so that's that's the the quick three minute introduction. Three minutes, two minutes. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks, Isaac. Thanks for sharing that. I know you had some. Uh, you kind of dove a little deeper in this in, in some of our talks last week, and so I thought it was a really neat story to be able to share with with everyone. Right, your your experiences. Um, so, how did you? How did you end up kind of uh, jumping into the, the entrepreneur, the startup scene in, in San Diego, um, of all places? Yeah, so on my second ship, uh, my commanding officer was someone who you know, was very interested in the technology space. I think he had gotten a master's uh, specifically in entrepreneurship, and he sought to bring that culture onto uh, USS Benfold. And so a lot of the department heads, junior officers, and him – uh, we really wanted to take some of the best practices that we saw uh, within, you know, Silicon Valley and other uh, tech spaces and try to bring them into the Navy because uh, they're culturally very different spaces. But um, we thought there were, there were things we could learn, you know, specifically with regards to organizational culture, um, with regards to how we handle meetings, with how we think about problem solving. Uh, we, we, we sort of wanted a little bit of a uh, cross pollination. And so um, he, he tried to embed that culture onto the ship. And, uh, you know, I had another department head who was just very into, into this stuff as well. 
And so long story short, you know, when my four years came up, uh, I had a decision to either stay in the Navy and, you know, do a short tour or just go ahead, get out, you know, and, and do other things. And so uh, I worked at Booz Allen for about five months just doing uh, defense contracting before I was like, okay, I, I think I'm ready. You know, I was like 26, 27 at that time. I was like, I think I'm ready to start a business. But I, I honestly had like no clue how little I knew uh, heading into this. And so I, I don't know what stage of entrepreneurship you're in in your life. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of hard lessons to be learned uh, in this road. Yeah, definitely. It seems like every day we, we encounter new lessons and have to, you know, encounter new problems that we didn't know existed before. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned wanting to talk a little bit about scalability. Now I know in, in, uh, you know, in, in our last conversation, um, you talked about almost this, this kind of success scenario between, you know, B2C and B2B companies. So I want to get into that a little bit later and then kind of, you know, let you um, kind of share your thoughts on that and dive into that a little deeper. But um, could you kind of explain, maybe it's from your experiences or, or, uh, or something like that, but why is, why is scalability um, so important um, in entrepreneurship and in the startup space? Yeah, so when you think about like, like specifically what is the thing that's going to get uh, investors excited, it's the prospect of making lots of money. And so if you like money and you like lots of it and you like it really quickly, you want products that scale. And so, uh, you know, I remember as a kid, I, I, I was always very entrepreneurial. Like I wanted to start my own business. I wanted to start my own boba shop. I wanted to start my own Chinese restaurant. Uh, and my, my parents were just like, no, don't do that. And, and, you know, one of the things I had realized over time was that there's almost no Chinese chains with the exception of like Panda Express. And, and, and one of the reasons is because you have to look at like the business model itself. Like most Chinese immigrants, when they come to the, the U S you know, it's like, they know how to cook, you know, learn a little bit from, you know, brought over whatever uh, from their home country, you know, brought the recipes over and just was like, okay, I'm going to put in hard work, labor, start a restaurant, make my 150, $200,000 a year, uh, working, you know, 70 hours a week. And that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and I'm only going to hire other Chinese people and like, we will grow to whatever capacity we can grow to by our own, like hard work and nothing more. But when, when you look at something like, like a Panda Express, they have a model, they have a scalable model, right? They have like standardized recipes. Uh, they have like, you know, like a short list of ingredients. They have a, a, you know, that, that, what do they call it? Quick casual. It's same. It's, it's sort of like in the same space as like Chipotle um, or some of these other restaurants. That's very like assembly line in, in, in how they do things. And then, so um, once you're able to get to a place where you can start thinking about like, how do you standardize processes? How do you, uh, create repetition in a system? How, how do you create quality control? Um, how do you acquire real estate? Like th these are conversations that most like first generation immigrants, like who start restaurants, they, ne they never think about these things because they just don't think like that. And so uh, I know I'm sort of rambling on, but like uh, just if you really want to scale beyond like your own uh, personal abilities, right? If you, if, if the, the sizing, if the size of your, your business is to expand in a, in a, um, in a way that's disproportional to the amount of effort you put in, you have to create scalable business models. And so, um, and I think this is really important because when I first started off in the entrepreneurial space, uh, especially for new entrepreneurs, I find a lot of people, uh, don't have scalable business models. You know, they'll, they'll create some sort of a gadget uh, that's like a physical product or they'll do some type of a consulting service. Um, and this isn't to like knock on those business models, but those like those things, they don't have the potential to get into that, like, you know, 50 million, 
hundred million billion dollar in sales. If you look at most of the the businesses that show up on a Shark Tank, it, it's precisely those types of businesses. It's like somebody made a cool product, and in order for it to really get anywhere, it's got to it's got to sell like some tremendous amount, like in the millions per year, uh, just to be considered a success. And, you know, when you're looking at how much revenue they're doing, um, like the really successful ones are doing like a million dollars in revenue, which, you know, that, 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 that's great if, if that's like what you're aspiring for. But I think, I think like a, like a series A, series B company, they wouldn't even look at you if like you didn't have the possibility of getting to 50 million, hundred million, like, you know, so, so, um, so for me, it was like when I was first in this space, I thought, you know, I was trying to sell specialty coffee to service members overseas. Um, I, I saw a need, I saw how much coffee we consumed on deployment. Um, I saw that there was very little e-commerce being done, uh, for military members. And I thought that this was a space that I could take advantage of, especially with like um, government subsidized shipping. So, so for those of you who don't know, like military members get um, heavily, heavily sub subsidized shipping when we, when we uh, are on deployment. So we, we send them these things called FPO, APO addresses. Um, they're, they're out of like, I think it's like Miami, San Francisco and uh, somewhere else. But, but, you know, for me to ship something, to a San Francisco address, you know, five bucks, seven bucks, right? So if you have a FPO AP address that goes to the San Francisco location, you're literally shipping a product to some command, some ship, you know, that's in the Middle East or in Japan, but you're paying San Francisco shipping prices. And so I, I was like, this is totally scalable. I just have to send cool stuff uh, to people um, and then hopefully exploit this like cheap shipping. So I thought, I thought that that was a, a scalable model. Uh, but once I like started getting into the business, I, I realized how difficult it was to scale the advertising. Um, that that's a whole other dimension that I had never thought of. Like for most of you and me, like if we were to do an e-commerce business, we can just put up Facebook ads. We can put up, you know, Instagram ads, uh, all different kinds of ads but you can't reach service members like that. You know, most, most people don't have access to like daily computer usage on deployment. Um, it was, and when I tried to, you know, like uh, market to families, market to um, different spouse organizations, they were very strict about what type of people they let into their circles. It, it just wasn't, um, it, it was just far more difficult than I thought. And I realized that for all the organizations and companies that were selling um, products to the military, they had to go through very, very defined um, paths to actually get you know, access to that market. Like it, it's not a, uh, if, if I were to like dumb this down, I, I'd say it's not, it's not a free market, right? It's a, it's a highly protected market that you have to navigate through um, the bureaucracy, you have to navigate through the protectionism to get access to that market. And so the level of effort that was necessary to do that um, was a lot. And, and so for me, I had, to, I had to sit there and literally calculate the numbers in my head thinking, you know, what is like, what do I have to do to get a customer base? Um, you know, how, how would I be doing marketing? how much am I spending on marketing, like, like the customer acquisition cost, right? And then like um, factor my customer acquisition cost with my margins, you know, how much it was gonna to cost to procure my products, how much it was gonna to cost to like package it, how much it was going to cost to ship it uh, and advertise it. Um, you know, when I started actually running these numbers, it became very, very clear to me uh, that I would have to sell like like a million bags of coffee a year, you know, and have my hair turn gray just to like, you know, get the same amount of money that I would have working at Booz Allen, right? Working at a defense contractor where I can just chill and like, you know, work with 50% effort and get like defense contractor money. And so, so I think, I think a lot of people 
uh, who, who go into entrepreneurship, when they, when they like don't think about these things, um, like in my case, it was too late. I already quit my job to go chase my dream. Right. Uh, but like, if you don't like calculate these, these percentages and you don't think about how do you scale your production, how do you scale your distribution? How do you scale your marketing? Um, these things don't, they don't pan out. Um, so just to kind of like continue on that, you know, when I, when I first started coming to San Diego's like startup events, um, and I started seeing who all was attending and who all was engaging and it, it um, I realized that through talking to a lot of people that I didn't meet a whole lot of entrepreneurs. What I met was a whole bunch of people trying to sell me services um, in the entrepreneurial space. So people, you know, for every entrepreneur out there, there's a million people trying to sell him websites. There's a million people trying to sell him SEO services. There's a million people trying to sell, you know, email services. So there, there's a, there's an entire, I, I call this like a startup industrial complex um, universe out there of people trying to sell products just to other entrepreneurs, other businesses. And I, I realized that like, okay, assuming I made $0 on my startup, I would still have to shell out tens of thousands of dollars to these website makers, to these SEO companies, to these graphic designers, to the entire industrial complex. And, and you know, the, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized like, Oh, the money is literally, the money is really in B2B like business to business means you can sell things in volume to fewer like people and have much what like larger margins. And, and, and like when that light bulb went off in my head, I was like, why am I just dying over here trying to sell, you know, enormous amounts of product at enormous volumes to enormous amounts of people at super low margin when I could probably go in the software space, find like 10 clients and make like a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Just like the, that, that sort of, um, I, I don't want to like, I don't want to make it seem like it's easy to do B2B software, but when I started looking at how tech companies we know today monetize, you know, when you, when you look at like how Facebook makes money, how Twitter makes money, how Slack makes money, how Airtable makes money, how Tableau makes money, uh, you know, the, the, the really large successful companies, they're selling enterprise software, software that businesses can use to help them improve their daily operations and make more money. Like the really large successful tech companies don't sell to like individual people uh, with the exception of like Amazon, of course. Right. Um, but Amazon, Amazon's providing a product that takes a cut of every transaction. Uh, and that cut is taken from businesses. Um, so, so that's sort that's sort of like one of the things I kind of wanted to like, just, uh, indoctrinate in your head, just something to think about because it's like when you look at our society and you look at what types of companies can succeed and cannot succeed, um, there's a lot of structural forces that, that, that constrain that. Um, when you look at like physical products, you know, if you're, if you're in the, the specialty food space, unless you get access, um, like to gigantic distributors, uh, you're never going to be able to scale your product like to the millions of units, right? To the tens of millions of units. And so once you gain access to that distribution, like it usually means that they already bought you out, acquired you, or you signed some sort of a deal. But regardless, like you're not the person who's holding uh, a majority share of that organization anymore. Um, when you look at a lot of the hardware out there, uh, like, you know, physical things, uh, people in the hardware space will tell you almost any piece of hardware ends up becoming a race to the bottom because they, they, you know, whether it's televisions, you know, DVD players, drones, uh, I'm just making stuff up now at this point, but like 
those products will continue to get better and better and better, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You know, they'll follow their Moore's law. They'll follow all these things um, within the industry that, that basically says performance is going to keep getting better. Right. Like, and you keep having to improve and your competitors are going to keep getting stronger and stronger. Uh, but, but hardware is essentially a race to the bottom. Whereas software, you'll see that with things like Microsoft Word, you know, Office products with Esri products like ArcGIS, um, Salesforce, a lot of these companies, once you get that, uh, once you sort of get, get that foothold in the industry, nobody wants to pivot. They would rather hold on to legacy software for decades and decades and decades than like try something new because other like there's a learning curve to it. Like even if you created like a Microsoft Excel that was 10,000 times better than Excel, everybody knows Excel. They don't want to pivot from Excel. Right. Um, and th this kind of goes for, for, for a lot of uh, software products, but, um, but still in general, if you were to move into something that, that wasn't, quite like anything else already on the market, your ability to scale these products um, to businesses is very easy. Because once you've built the software, like aside from advertising and aside from like maybe infrastructure maintenance, like you don't, you don't have to put in nearly the same amount of work to, to, to scale it uh, because it's just, it's, it's, it's on the internet. You, you just hit that download button, right? And so, um, I'm trying to think about where I wanted to go with this. But I, and Isaac, and Isaac yeah, yeah. just off, offhand, we did get some questions from, from the cohort and stuff like that, that just came up on chat. We can talk about those too, but I'll let Steven, if you have any other questions offhand for Isaac, but I have three questions from on the, on the, uh, on the chat I can ask too. Sure. Um, so Isaac, there, there was, you know, a thing or two I just wanted to kind of focus on. I know, you kind of give us a, some really good insight there on a lot of different things. Um, could you kind of dive into, or maybe for, for a little bit, kind of give us um, a little deeper insight on you mentioned B2B versus B2C. Why is, is B2B the better play? Um, are there kind of this, these barriers to entry with B2C you have to worry about just, you know, in a general sense. And then if you were to, you know, start your entrepreneur, entrepreneurship journey again knowing what you know now is there certain products that you would kind of focus on in, in one space or another yeah okay okay um so i would say one of the first things i noticed about b2b is when you look at say like a uline you know that sells like office products and stuff or if you look at a lot of these wholesale distributors like their websites are garbage just, just horribly designed, super ugly, not user friendly. Uh, if you've ever used Facebook before and you look at like their, uh, like, like if you, the, the business side of Facebook, right? Their business pages, it, it's, it's, there's entire companies designed just to go around Facebook's horrible user interface uh, to, to create ads. And, and so I started thinking, I was like, why? why is the B2B website so much uglier than the B2C websites? Well, part of it's because the value proposition of B2B is so much simpler than the value proposition of B2C. So when you do B2C, it's like, basically, does your product help you make more money? Does your product help you gain customers? Does your product help you manage operations better? It's very like rational numbers driven. Like it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't have to involve like sex appeal and consumer psychology. And, you know, a lot of these really complex things that go into like B2C. And so if you're, if you're a person who's like, I can make this widget that's going to improve, you know, your efficiency by X amount of time, because I've created redundant navigation and blah, blah, blah. And you, if, you're, if your mind generally thinks in metrics and math and efficiency, like B2B is for you. Like if you're, if you're a master marketer and you just like understand how people think and you like can figure out humanity for all its quirks, you know, maybe you have a shot at B2C. 
but I, I'm not that kind of person. Like, like when you sell the B2B, you basically say, buy X amount of units for this price. It's going to help you with this and it's going to help you with your sales, right? It's going to make things more efficient and you know, here's a sample, use it for a little bit. If you like it, I'm going to put you on a subscription and you're going to give me money in perpetuity. Like it, it, it's, it's a much simpler model. It allow it also allows you to like keep consistent uh, flow. Like if you look at some consumer products, um, your ups and downs are they're, sorry. There, there's just a lot more ups and downs in your um, sales volume over time. Whereas if you do uh, software, especially to like government or you know like large clients, you know that money's going to keep coming in like forever and ever and ever and ever and ever until somebody displaces you and overcomes like the institutional inertia. Um, so, so, so I, I guess to, to answer your, your question shortly, B2B, in my opinion, Isaac Wang's opinion, is, is something that's a very straightforward math driven, metric driven, like value proposition. B2C, there's a lot more marketing and consumer psychology going on. And like, I, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this like black rifle coffee company. Um, they're basically like this military owned coffee company that just plays off of like, like culture war, right? It's, it's about guns rights and it's about manliness and military guys. I mean, I, I thought I was selling a better coffee product than they were, but like nobody cares, right? Like coffee was never, what was for sale what was for sale was like like that culture um i can i can tell you you know sit here and tell you like talk all day about where i source my coffee and you know like all the varietals of coffee but like no nobody cares about that stuff but you know who does care roasters wholesale roasters and so so you know when i had gotten into the coffee space the the, the coffee companies that do best um like most of the, the, the big coffee companies, they're not, they don't focus on their retail operations. They don't focus on their shops. They focus on selling wholesale coffee in large volumes to other small shops. Those are the ones that get big, right? And in your third wave coffee space, it's like your, your stump towns, your intelligentsia. Um, I, I, I can name like a million different roasters, but like they focus on their wholesale product, their wholesale roasting of beans. Um, their shops are just window dressing uh, to push like maybe a hundred thousand dollars in sales a year, but like their wholesale might be selling millions of dollars in coffee beans a year. Um, so, so, so those two experiences looking at websites, looking at, you know, the coffee industry and looking at a lot of other industries, it, it sort of made me realize that like, if you, if you wanted to go uh, to really scale, get a lot bigger, you, you do kind of have to focus on, selling to businesses and um, it, it shapes how you think about scaling. And I forgot what the, uh, the second part to your question was. That's okay. You kind of, you kind of answered it in that first one. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Well, uh, I mean, thanks for, for that insight. I think that's a, it's a great story and it really tells, you know, some of the, the difficulties you face, you know, B2C versus B2B, what that actually looks like. Um, you know, I think Curling and I talked to, you know, a number of, of entrepreneurs over the years that uh, some of them, you know, end up hashing out as, as they go through and having to pivot, you know, going one way or another, right, B2B or B2C. Uh, and initially when they jumped in, you know, not knowing that there's, you know, roadblocks they might face, you know, stretching their business model, you know, this way versus that way, right? And so having some of that insight beforehand, you know, learning from somebody like you who's gone through some of those experience, right, um, can help a lot of people streamline that process, right, to think about what their business model might look like, um, you know, to avoid having to probably pivot or adapt as much, you know, down the road, right. Um, Curling, I did want to open it up to you. I know uh, we have a few questions in the chat, too. Um, but, yeah, uh, this, that, yeah, Curling, it, it, did you have a question? Yeah, let's, let's go with the, the chat too, just on the amount of time. I know um, one thing I know, Brianna had a really good question. I know we also have one from John too. Brianna, you can, you want to unmute yourself and just ask us? This is a really great question. This is one of my questions I was going to ask too. 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, just as a startup, is it best to build your company as both B2B and B2C in order to widen your consumer base and maximize revenue? Or is it best to just start off just sticking to one or the other? Great question. Uh, okay, so Curly, you've, 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 you've uh, given me quite a lot of insight on this over the years. It's during your design process, when you're doing your journey mapping and when you're building your product, um, I would venture to guess that as you're doing your design, you will find out that the needs of a B2B customer versus the needs of a B2C customer are like really, really different, right? Like I, I would find it very difficult uh, for those two products to be the same. You would have to do almost like two completely different uh, design processes. Like if I was trying to sell coffee to the average consumer, you know, at a coffee shop, right? Like my, my margins are completely different. How I make my product is completely different. Um, how I do my marketing, uh, you know, I'm trying, like, I'm going to focus on selling a, a cup of sugar with a splash of espresso in there and charge you $4 and 50 cents for it. And I'm going to make you feel good about giving me that much money for it. Right. Like that's very different than trying to sell coffee to a coffee shop where I'm thinking about, Hey, how can I get a co you know, a five pound bag to go between 50 to $60, um, deliver to you on time, provide you something that's consistent that you can probably procure over multiple seasons. Uh, like I, I'm just rambling, but it's like who you're designing for completely like shapes what kind of product you're going to make. And it's very likely that your B2C customer is going to be very different than your B2B customer. So, so, so uh, if you want me to give you an answer, um, I take no responsibility, but like I would say focus on one uh, and focus on B2B. That's just my bias. That's a good one. I, I know we also have Sam online too. Sam, do you do you want to give me feedback on the what we kind of discussed? You might you might be in a different little spot too. Um, oh, I'm here now. I just got to get myself off mute. Um, uh, no I, problem. I agree. Uh, what I would I would always focus on one customer to start. Right, one need to start, one customer need to start, and and as you grow. And what you would do and probably what everybody would re recommend is focus on the most profitable one. Because if you focus on the most profitable need, whether that's B2B or B2C, um, then it's going to allow you to, to be able to grow your company and to expand to more needs, to expand to new markets, to expand maybe from B2B to B2C. So um, pick one to start. We, I throw this all, all, all around all the time, Curly says it too now, I think, is that you want to be the Amazon of books before you're the Amazon of everything. And so the goal there is kind of pick, pick that most profitable space. Going to another kind of point that was made is that when you look at, for example, Facebook, a lot of us perceive Facebook as a B2C company, but they're actually B2B, right? The people who pay Facebook, where their revenue comes from, are all business clients, right? Uh, we get it as uh, as a we're not necessarily customers as we are more partners of Facebook. Uh, Facebook needs us so that they can sell advertisements to businesses. And so I think a lot of people, when we, we think of that, uh, there's two ways to get people like us to sell ads, right? Uh, in case of Facebook, what they do is they they've spent a lot of money on a platform that we value. So we exchange our time. Um, they could either give us a platform or they could pay us for it, right? So in their case, they found it a much better margins if they could provide a platform that people valued that they would use that, and then turn around and sell our time, our attention to, to their customers who are businesses doing advertising. So in some cases, uh, you're, you're also looking at this idea of consumers, but you're doing it in, in the idea that they're going to be partners of your business you're going to sell directly to, to, uh, to other businesses. Anyway, so those are a couple thoughts I was thinking of. No, those, those are great, Sam. I have one more question to uh, Stephen. I'll read off from the chat for, um, 
for Isaac. Isaac, you know, like what are your thoughts now on quitting your day job to fully pursue an entrepreneurship adventure, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's your feedback on that? On uh, if you went through that process before, but that was one of the questions. Um, hmm. I can't rewind time, so uh, I guess it doesn't matter. I, I would say I probably should have did a little bit of research, especially learn a little bit more about marketing uh, before going into entrepreneurship. I think I think I was just like very hot headed at 27, and I just like thought I knew better, and I was like, I'm just going to jump into business making. But it's harder than you think. Like it's, it's, it's way harder than you think. And depending on what industry you go into, uh, to go into business with no experience, um, I'm not saying it can't work, but a lot of people are going to fail. Uh, and for me to give up like a good paying job, you know, that, that financially set me back for years. Like right at that time I had gotten married. Had we done dual income for three, four years, like we probably have at least a half million dollars in savings. Um, instead, you know, here I am. Like, I, I think I, I, I appreciate like everyone who goes into entrepreneurship because they are chasing their dream and, and it is a brave thing to do. Um, but like, if you, it's not for everybody and you make sure you have a spouse that's like willing to accept uh, that type of risk because like until you succeed, it's like a really painful, lonely journey and struggle. Um, you know, even for me today, like I, I still haven't like made it, you know, right, right before this, uh, this political campaign, I was working on a, um, on like political software that was helping people go door to door. Uh, we were basically trying to come up with a way to visualize where voters were, you know, uh, break it down by demographics, by age, by, you know, gender, by political party preference, by zip code location. And we were trying to create like a, a geospatial interface for, for making political campaigns more efficient. Uh, and things were going really well. I even used it on my own campaign to try to improve some of the efficiencies for reaching out to voters. Uh, then the pandemic hit. And when you have a pandemic that's spread by like people, your, your software that focuses on improving door-to-door -door operations, that immediately dies. Uh, that, that was a real heartbreak for me because I, I thought we were finally uh, getting into a product that had a lot of good potential. Um, and there was a lot, you know, the, there are a lot of people running for office. There are a lot of people who knock doors as their primary strategy for running for office. I, and I thought that that was something we had that was better than anything else on the market. Um, and COVID hit and it, you know, it is what it is like, like, but, but I'm going to keep trying, right? Like, like if you're an entrepreneur, it's like, it's, it's in your blood. You're always going to be working on new products. Uh, there's always new opportunities to, to change the world, make money, disrupt industries, uh, whatever that is. I like, I, I'm still keeping my head, my head high. No, that's, that's good. And I, I like how you ended it, ended it on that note too. Uh, Cause you, you, you learned a lot. We have learned a lot on when you talk about immigrants, though, we have learned, just like you said about this risk factor, uh, people who came over to the States, one of the superpowers that they have is that they have this risk factor. <laughs> and somewhat, they, uh, that's one of their superpowers, that they take risks by just even coming over to a new country, new language, a new experience, doing a company and doing that type of risk, you have to have that same type of uh, risk tolerance. So we have been learning a lot with our data though, just so you know, uh, Isaac, people who are immigrants have this superpower and that makes them actually really well versed to be a good founder. Just so you know, doesn't matter about education, anything like that, but that's just our data. Um, what, when, when, one thing I was gonna say, I, I know we have the other cohorts on, I know we have Sam too. Sam, one thing I was going to ask you too, I know you were talking about the innovation challenge. We'll, we'll save that to the end, but do you have any final thoughts, Sam? And I'll give you some final thoughts. Uh, to, I, I, uh, I was just going to ask Isaac one question because, uh, you know, he, he, was, he described that first experience of selling coffee. And 
that the challenge, there were two, two challenges. One was marketing. And, and I think that's always uh, a challenge of businesses is it, uh, getting people to bump into your business because, you know, the, the value, I, I, it sounds like the value was there, right? The, the amount of coffee that, that uh, the military members drink is high. Um, the access to quality coffee might be low. So, so there was that, that the, the need there, the marketing was challenging. That was one thing he addressed, but he also addressed, uh, or was talking a little bit about the challenges in his business process. How do you fulfill all those orders and, and make it a, a possibility to run this business and scale this business. I was just wondering, looking back now, maybe as you, ex, you experience, you know, gone through this entrepreneurial process a number of times, do you feel like if you were to go back to that business, there would be new technologies, new um, tools to use to maybe improve that process? Is it something that, that like experience ha would reshape how you approached the, that fulfillment? Or is it something that would is still too difficult uh, with current technology? Yeah, so I, I would say um, one. I think everyone should read this book uh, called I think it's called like Bullseye or something by Gabriel Weinberg. Um, do you know which one I'm talking about, Curling? It's yes, like, but I it's can't about, remember the. Yeah, I know. I know it, the it's about marketing. It talks about he, he has this thing called a bullseye method. Um, that's about like targeted how to, how to do marketing and iterate and figuring out which strategies work for you. Uh, I, I think for me, my biggest lesson learned, um, sorry, I, I'm trying to remember why I mentioned Gabriel Weinberg. So in, in his, his uh, book, he talks about doing product development and marketing concurrently. Uh, a lot of people, they build a product first, then they realize that they never thought about the marketing and like they can't actually market it, even if it's a product that people want. Um, or it's like, you know, you just built the wrong product, but the, uh, when you're doing like your, your journey mapping and you're trying to understand your customer really well, um, there needs to be a lot of due diligence put into that process. Like, I, I don't think, I don't think I thought about how difficult it was to like make coffee on a ship, you know, like, like during deployment, I recall having this French press and whenever the ship would like you know, start moving around, like the French press starts moving, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was showering, the water on my, fr on our frigate would just go from scalding hot to freezing cold. Uh, it, it was really strange, but like, like the process of making coffee was really hard. Like stuff is going everywhere. Like people don't want to do that. Like they just, they just don't. And a lot of people don't have access to boiling water. Um, a lot of people don't have access to quality grinders. Mm. Like if you don't have a quality burr grinder, uh, the consistency of the coffee you make is not going to be the same. But just a, a lot of the things I had learned about the Scott, like specialty coffee industry, they would just never apply in, in a military environment. And so, so what, I what I was trying to do was to impose my way of making coffee onto service members. And it doesn't really work that way. You have to like, you know, think about it where, where, where they're coming from, what their like experience is like, and then you sort of have to, to, to mold to them, to mold to your customer. Um, I, I don't think I thought through that process enough before I quit a high paying job and, you know, jumped to go chase my dream. So, so if, if I was to do it again, I would probably have, you know, done that due diligence um, in, in trying to understand my customer. I probably would have realized that there was no hope and I probably would have never done the business to begin with. But I think that would have saved me two years of my life, a lot of salary, a lot of heartache. Uh, and, and you know, but, but like, it, it doesn't matter. It's done. Like I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. I'm still happy. Um, but th those were, those were like two very painful years of my life because I hadn't done the things that curling told me to. <laughs> I, I, I have the same experience, you know, the way we start businesses today is so much more efficient and thought out than we did. You know, when I started a first business about what, 2008, 2009, you know, we, we wasted a million dollars before we realized our business model was wrong. And the way people, customers buy isn't necessarily the, what we thought. And, and we never asked anybody. We just tried to, like you said, impose our, 
our methodologies onto our customers and, and it backfired and it took uh, a lot of learning and you know we were able to recover from that but uh same same experience like the way we do things now is much better yeah were there other parts to your question, Sam, that I didn't address? I, I can't remember. Now. No, I think it's right. I, I think you you described it. there. There's an there's generally an interest, but the whole customer mapping, the process mapping, you, you realize in the end that <laughs> you, you you couldn't solve all the problems with just selling coffee, right? You talked about the ship having all that is it, it's much a, a much bigger challenge than just hey buy a bag of coffee. Uh, to enjoy. So makes sense yeah. now. Yeah. Makes sense. Thanks. Isaac. Yep. Um, That's I, great. I think That's a lot great. of people never thought through, um, uh, this stuff. So, and I think, I think at that time drop shipping and the whole like subscription box business model was like very, very popular. Um, but you know, a few people made it, but most people failed at it. Right. Like I think guys like your dollar shave clubs and, I forgot what some of the other ones were, uh, but they've gone out of business since. Like the, I think Amazon's just crushed everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely definitely a, a challenging market. But uh, maybe you you were ahead of the curve though, Isaac. Too sometimes uh, being ahead of it. <laughs> and, and I had an even harder challenge was um, if you go on a Navy ship, they're like at that time they were still using like Internet Explorer six. Nah the the internet was so slow that it would take you like three hours just to upload your Facebook feed, assuming you had internet access at all. Like the, the technological challenges uh, were significant. And, and I had to, believe it or not, I had to actually, uh, when I was trying to build the website, like my website developers were like, oh, let's add this function and that function and that function. And I was like, no, can you figure out how to deliver like what needs to be there for like the lowest amount of like, computing power possible. So we had to literally like try to dumb down the website uh, to make it accessible to people on ships who had like super, super low bandwidth. So you had some other challenges too that, that maybe other people didn't have. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think most people don't realize like how backwards a lot of the military's like, like, you know. Technology is up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> no, that's interesting, that's interesting. That's good, good knowing your customers is key is key um thank you so much thanks for being really transparent to isaac on this i think that that helps out the groups when 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 founders are really transparent on their challenges and you know uh such obstacles i know i used to have steven um maybe wrap it up but uh i, I just want to thank thank you personally yeah it's always good seeing you Kelly. We have a, uh, a special guest that's going to say hi to you, though, Isaac, real quick. Hey! Uh, <laughs> right. I think that's uh, Matt Harper. He was, uh, he kind of head up, head up your, your first tactical launch cohort. So he said, uh, is uh, Isaac still on? So I, so I just, I just let, uh, just love. How you doing, Matt? Can you hear us? Um, I think, yeah, I might have to unmute. It, he's connecting on audio now. But uh, he told me earlier, Isaac, he said, oh, I, I, he had a meeting, but he said he wanted to wish you, wish you good luck and he, he just wanted to say hi to you. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you, can, you can say hi, uh, uh, Matt. Can you, you, you got it? He's just going to give you a wave. Maybe <laughs> you guys could connect afterwards. Um, yeah. But we got uh, – Stephen, you, you, can, you can wrap up. Sure. Um, so, yeah, Isaac, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Um, you know, Matt, if you want to, you know, recap of what's happened, feel sure to look on our YouTube. We got it all recorded. So, so if you want to relive our conversation <laughs> with Isaac, you can do that. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, thanks for coming on Isaac. I think this is awesome, right? You give us some, some great insight into scalability. I loved hearing, you know, your stories, your experiences, right? Your, your successes, your failures, problems you face, how you got around them, all that fun stuff, especially all the insight B2B, B2C. That was really awesome. So thank you for that. Um, if you guys are watching this recorded on YouTube, uh, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. The more interaction we get with videos like this, the more it gets pushed out to, to more people. And who knows that, that like you gave us might've allowed this to be, 
be sent to an entrepreneur or startup. And, you know, they might've really needed to hear some of this stuff, right? It might've really helped them out and saved them some time. So feel free to do that if you get a chance. Um, should we give the floor to, uh, to Sam to talk about Innovation Hub or? Yeah, Sam, do you have any, any update on the Innovation Challenge? I know that that, that came up. Yeah, we're just going to come up on the last couple of days of our summer innovation challenge. We'll also have a fall one for those who are interested. So yeah, again, our, our theme is helping K through 12 schools who are, are struggling with distance learning requirements or are trying to get back on campus with new social distancing rules and regulations. And so there's a lot of challenges schools, administrators, teachers, students, parents face with, with this upcoming fall season. So if you have an idea um, about how to help, what you want to do is, is submit that to the innovation challenge. All, all, all that's required to compete is a two to three page executive summary describing the problem you're trying to address, the solution that you're going to, you know, you, you came up with and then just kind of how that works. So uh, submit that, it's due by August 1st. And you can uh, compete for some cash prizes and obviously some some recognition and, and we'll get the word out. Uh, hopefully those who are competing and hearing about this will also take advantage of our, our weekly cohort here um, come this fall. So we're, we're uh, we meet together and, and talk through these and help you guys get some of this stuff started. So, all right. Thank you very much. German. Thanks, Sam. Oh, sorry. If you, if you want to submit, go to the CSUSM innovation hub, just search that on Google. Um, you'll find the, the link to the challenge submission site. Yeah, that's awesome. great. Well, thank you, Sam. All right. Well, uh, that concludes our, our latest tech school episode. So I'll let you guys go, but, uh, take care everyone. All right. Take care.